Hi guys, my name is Kyle with Sheets Woodworks. In this video, I'm gonna show you guys how I created my first ever epoxy table. Obviously, the first thing we needed to do was find a slab, and let me just start off by saying that slabs are not cheap. I was searching for months for something like this, and I happened to stumble across a place that was actually moving storefronts, and they were doing somewhat of a liquidation sale. I was able to get this slab for about half price, and that's what basically started this whole project. During that process of selecting the wood, a couple of things I kept in mind was the moisture content of the wood. I really wish I would have bought a uh, pinless moisture meter before I bought this slab, uh, but I took the, the word of the company that I bought it from and uh, it actually turned out all right. I ended up buying a moisture meter uh, a couple weeks later and checked it and it was dry all the way through. The thing that probably took me the longest on this table was figuring out the size of it. Um, as you've just seen on screen here, I changed the size of my template probably about three times before I landed on this one that was about 30 inches by 50 inches. After making my first cut, I identified this large crack that I knew I was not going to be able to fix on my own. I decided to move the template up a couple inches and cut again. You can see I tried changing out the blade on that old skill saw. Unfortunately, the damage was done from that old blade and I burned the motor out. Fortunately, I did have this DeWalt circular saw that I wasn't confident would be able to cut through that black walnut. It actually did a pretty good job. The only problem was that the blade was six and a quarter and the seven and a half was the one that I needed. That's okay though, because I was able to cut that small remaining material with the sawzall, and these are rough cuts anyways. Now that we have our dimensions very close to where we want them to be, it's time to start cleaning up the slab. The objective here is to clean the slab, remove all of that dirt, kick up any loose pieces, and remove the softwood. On this slab, there was a lot of softwood. For the majority of the dirt and the softwood on this slab, I was able to use my angle grinder with a wire wheel disc on it. The wire wheel did a great job cleaning up that dirt and softwood, and any scuffs that it made on the actual black walnut hardwood would be able to be cleaned up with a sander or a planer later on. Because of this slab, I actually bought my first set of chisels. These chisels worked great. Unfortunately, they were brand new and very sharp, and for this kind of work, you probably should use some old ones if you have them. This is kind of a perfect example to show how much softwood was actually on this slab. I essentially created a whole nother valley that epoxy would go into, and while I wasn't super happy about this, we were able to make it look pretty natural. As we approach the end of cleaning this slab, it's time to start thinking about the mold. For this mold, we are going to use MDF that we got from Home Depot. I chose an 8x4 sheet, which would be perfect for this 30-inch uh, by 50-inch table. Creating the form was not super difficult. It's essentially a box with five sides. The most important part is to use caulk and brad nails to hold it all together. Lastly, to keep the black dye from bleeding into the wood, we did a thin coat of epoxy on the slab before we poured the deep side coat. We used about three gallons of liquid glass deep pour epoxy. This ratio is, I believe, three to one. We poured in the A first, added the black dye, and then poured in the B. It is super important that you mix all of these ingredients well together. After the ingredients are mixed, you can finally start pouring the epoxy. While this deep pour epoxy is fantastic, it is not cheap. I highly recommend being very careful about where you pour it. In this instance, I really didn't want to get over the top of this slab, so I made sure to pour it very precisely into the holes and keep checking periodically for leaks. And not too far into pouring, we actually did start to have a leak. Fortunately, we were able to address a lot of them with just clamps. 
And while the clamps were able to work in this instance, I really wouldn't recommend it because that epoxy ended up drying onto the clamp and I still haven't been able to get some of that dried epoxy off these clamps to this day. Not the end of the world, but I have seen better ways to stop epoxy leaks. I've seen Blacktail Studios use flex paste, which is that stuff from the infomercials, to stop epoxy leaks before. He says that works very well. I think I'm going to start keeping a tub of that at the house when I do these pours. One of the things I wish we would have done before we started pouring was check that this table is level. You can see us checking in here, and the table is not level. That's okay, though. We were actually able to shim up uh, the wheels on the bottom of that rolling table, and uh, we were able to level it out that way. We were about a gallon short, so we ended up mixing up one more gallon. That brings the grand total of epoxy here to about four gallons total for this build. And here we are checking the level one more time. Wanted to also make sure that it was level across the table, so we used a uh, straight sheet of MDF and checked it that way. Once we poured the final gallon of epoxy, the last step was to wait three weeks for this epoxy to finish curing. Three weeks later, it was finally time to start breaking this table out of the mold. I wasn't sure what else to use here to get this epoxy table free. I ended up just using a hammer and tried to be as careful as possible. Around this point, I'm really happy that I used mold release. You can see once I got this table wedged, it was only a couple extra blows until it just released. The next step was to remove all of this excess epoxy and then also shorten the top side so that the river blends seamlessly into the black walnut. Maybe one day I'll be able to afford a 30 inch planer, but for now, we'll use a router table. Although I wish this table was mine, it is not. It's actually a shop not too far from my house that was nice enough to rent out some time for me to use it. Once we got the table back from the shop, it was time to start squaring off the edges. Another tool I don't have in my arsenal yet is a track saw. Fortunately, you can achieve pretty much the same results with a circular saw, some clamps, and a straight edge. I was advised by my fiance to remove this noise from the video. And while I didn't catch it, I'm glad that she did because it sounded like nails on a chalkboard. For the edge of the table, I decided to do a 45 degree chamfer. Really like the look of this. I'm not super into round over, although I did just do a new table uh, where I did a round over and I actually ended up really liking it. So. 45 chamfer here, but I might actually start going to round over. Before we started sanding, we did have to fill in a tremendous amount of chip out from that planer. We used CA glue and epoxy to fill in a majority of the holes. Once it was dried, we hit it with the sander. My sanding progression for this table was 80 grit to 120 to 150, all the way up to 180. After 180 grit, it was finally time to add the finish coat. For this table, we used Rubio Monocoat. We chose the natural version. And as someone that has used the Home Depot polyurethane finish for a lot of tables, I must say, this kind of puts that to shame. I don't know if I will ever finish a table without this stuff again. It is absolutely gorgeous. Not only is it tremendously easier to apply and get a uniform finish, it just looks so much better. The contrast, the sheen, it just really pops. And 
And I'm not quite sure there's a better feeling in the world than when you put that first coat of finish on a table, especially this stuff. So we're actually going to do two coats of this Rubio Monocoat, although it is Monocoat. Uh, black Walnut is a tremendously thirsty wood and it often requires two coats. So here's the protocol for adding on that second coat. We used a red, uh, or rather maroon, Scotch-Brite pad to kind of scuff up the top layer of this table. Tried to do our best to make it as uniform across the entire top of this, and essentially just hit it with another coat right after that. It was pretty much that easy. The final finishing touch on this table was using some threaded inserts. The nice part about threaded inserts is you can remove these legs basically as many times as you want and there's never going to be any wiggle or play with the legs over time. You can tighten them down, obviously not too tight so that the wood can move, but really, really great addition to any table. Thanks for watching the video, guys. If you're interested in this table, it's available on my Etsy page. You can also reach out to me personally. If you like this content, make sure to like and subscribe.